Today we're going to be talking about Marx's Das Kapital, or Capital. This was his main work. I'm just going to go over some of the most valuable and interesting concepts from the piece that we read for today. Use value and exchange value. So use value is pretty simple. This is the utility of a commodity or its ability to satisfy wants and desires. So for example, a pencil, a pen, a phone, these all serve a purpose for you. Exchange value is about equivalencies. So how much of a given commodity, for example, corn, it takes to equal the value of another commodity, for example, iron, something that you're going to trade with. So how many books can I give you in exchange for your old com computer? Now, Mark said that in order for that to happen, for us to be able to trade and exchange things, there has to be a third variable to um, compare these things to. And that third variable is labor. So the value of an object is determined ultimately by the amount of labor, labor time, hours, weeks, months, etc., that it takes to produce something. By figuring this out, by equating the value of goods with labor time, Marx not only outlined the economic principles that guide exchange, he also unmasked the root source of exploitation inherent in capitalist production. In a capitalist economy, those who do not own the means of production have no choice but to sell their labor power in order to survive. They produce a surplus. Surplus value is the difference between what workers earn for their labor and the price or value of the goods they produce. They produce a surplus for their employer. Now the capitalist has two principal means at his disposal for increasing profit and market share. They can increase absolute or relative surplus value. Absolute surplus value is just extending the working day. Relative surplus value involves increasing the productivity of labor by instituting time-saving procedures. So I don't have to increase the amount of hours my workers work, but I can increase how much productivity, how much they are expected to produce in the same amount of time. And I'm sure many of you have experienced that at your places of work. Another important concept from this piece, fetishism of commodities. This is a reworked version of Marx's concept on alienation that we read in economic and philosophic manuscripts. I mentioned that he was working out some of his ideas that would become more fully developed in his later published pieces. He's also reworking his ideas on the power of money. Fetishism refers to the distorted relationship between individuals and the production and consumption of goods. So Marx is arguing that we treat the goods that we buy as if they have magical powers and we lose sight of the fact that we were the ones who created these things in the first place. By doing this, we grant them a power over us that in reality they don't hold. So there are some examples in your textbook that Edels and Appleruth provide of fetishized commodities. They talk about advertisements, the message, for example, that if you buy this particular shampoo or deodorant or lotion or razor, you'll get the girl or the guy and have all the success. People will view you differently because the product will magically transform you. The power of money is a little bit different what he was trying to work out earlier, and that is just that if you're wealthy, if you have money, then you therefore have talent and all these other attributes are, are, are given to you because simply because you have that money. But here he's speaking about purchasing a commodity. Our self-esteem and status is attached to these commodities. If we drive a certain car or have certain things, it makes us better people or that's what we, we think. Marx's work clearly influenced Thorstein Veblen's Veblen develops the concepts of conspicuous consumption and conspicuous leisure. Looking at these images, I'm sure you can understand what he meant by these concepts. So Veblen is arguing that capitalism produces an incredible surplus of goods, and that surplus could be used to improve the standard of living for all. Instead, it's wasted through the purchase of commodities to flaunt and elevate our status within our communities. The wealthy do this, but the middle class tries to do it as well. Right At the beginning of the semester, I talked about Pierre Bordeaux in his work Social Distinction and how the working and middle classes tries to emulate the upper classes, tries to be like them. But we purchase expensive cars and clothes and handbags. 
when a cheaper brand would do just fine. The wealthy also engage in conspicuous leisure, dedicating loads of time to learning the finer points in dining, in etiquette, in golf. But the point is, is to best others in the status order. It's not about bettering society, right? The time spent on speaking the correct grammar, etc. It's not really about bettering the world. It's, it's about having status. And you see that in the film Born Rich, Children of the Insanely Wealthy, which we saw earlier this semester. Um, there was one clip that we didn't get to. Of course, you can always take a look at that where it's the gentleman who starts playing the piano. He shares his experience going through the, to the tailor and he's kind of mocking what he's doing. He understands what he's doing, but he takes a lot of this tailor's time talking about the finer points of buttons and all the fine details of buttons. And even as he's talking, you know that he understands that this really isn't about bettering society. It's about his status and his ability to do that and his ability to waste people's time in doing that because he's extremely wealthy. The other point Marx makes about fetishism and commodities is that we grant special magical powers to the machines that we work with, to technology. So we start blaming the technology at work and increasing technology for replacing us as laborers, we don't blame capitalists for this. Gramsci would say that we're taught to not even see the capitalist. We blame the machines. All of our frustrations with the economy, with our situations, get placed onto other things. So we're displacing our frustration onto something else. And this is similar to Edna Bonasich's split labor market theory. So what she is arguing is that the market is split between various classes that have different levels of power. So you have capitalists. These are the small groups of people who control capital investments and the means of production, and they buy the labor of many others. Then you have the managers. This is a modest sized group of people who work as administrators for the capitalists. They supervise others. They've been granted control over the workers. They work for the capitalists. They don't buy the labor power. They supervise the laborers. Then you have the petite bourgeoisie. This is the small scale merchants who control their own businesses. They do most of the work themselves. They buy little labor power from others. And then you have the working class. The working class is a very large group of blue and white collar workers who sell their labor to employers in return for wages and salaries. The key here is that the working class is also split. And here you begin to see those racial antagonisms. Capitalists seek ever cheaper labor. And instead of seeing the capitalist as the enemy, white work workers, white working class sees the cheaper labor, usually people of color, as the enemy. People of color, immigrants. Ultimately, capitalists can then maintain control because the working class is split from each other. They're not likely to unite and realize a class consciousness and fight the capitalist class. We don't blame the capitalists. We blame the immigrants or the reserve army of labor. So as Marx said in the Communist Manifesto, in his theory of change, it starts at that individual level and then becomes collective. But somewhere in the individual level, we're not fighting our true enemies. We're fighting the enemies of our enemies, and we're fighting each other. Some other key points to know from Capital. Marx describes the cycle or circulation of commodities peculiar to capitalism. Unlike other economic arrangements, production under capitalism is driven by profit. So the main concern is with generating more capital, not with the standard of living. The guiding profit motive is a cycle of exchange, Marx labeled as MCM where M is money and C is commodity. So MCM is the process where we're buying to sell. The capitalist converts his or her money into a commodity. So M to C, by purchasing additional machinery, raw materials, or labor, the capitalist then sells their finished product as a commodity in exchange for money. So that's MCM. For others, the cycle of exchange takes an inverse path. The worker enters into exchange possessing only their labor, which they sell as a commodity on the market. The commodity, labor, is then exchanged for money, M, or a wage. The worker then takes the money and spends it on the commodities, C, necessary to su survive. So this is CMC. That, the process of CMC 
must be repeated on a daily basis as the commodities bought by the worker are usually consumed immediately. So this is pretty straightforward to us now, but in Marx's day, it was unique for him to be laying this out. Some alternatives to capitalism we're going to talk about with Kathy Mulder's work, and that's what you'll be re reading next, Transcending Capitalism Through Cooperative Practices. Kathy has come to my classes to give her presentation. This semester she's not going to be able to, so we're going to talk about that together. And I've also written a review that is published in Critical Sociology that you can take a look at uh, my review of her book. Let's quickly look at some of the common criticisms of Marx before I give you an overview on Kathy's work. One of the main critiques of Marx is that communism doesn't work because it failed in the Soviet Union and in the People's Republic of China. Now having read Marx, you should understand a little bit why that critique is incomplete. If we go back to Marx's original argument, historical materialism, we find that Marx said that history was progressive and that capitalism had to come first before communism could be successful. So if you go back to the German ideology, and particularly page 44 in your textbook, you read that communism can only work as a final stage in history if at first capitalism becomes a global phenomenon. Without that, communism will not be successful. Capitalism has to spread first and then fail. Then communism can develop as a world movement. It cannot be successful as just a local event. So Mars did not mean the Soviet Union. It didn't go through capitalism. It went from feudalism to communism. And really, if you read Richard Wolff's work, it went from feudalism to state capitalism and was only communism by name. So we'll watch a film on the Soviet Union later, which shows you how similar this was to actually what was going on in the United States and to be a model of American cities. What's more, Marx, when he's talking about parcelization and centralization, he's basically saying that every society divides property differently. And he allows for the possibility that societies go through the historical stages differently. So you can go from parcelization, where the property is divided out, to centralization, where one person rules all the land, or vice versa. Every history is different. Capitalism has to become universal because it will then abolish those differences. Also, in the Soviet Union and the PRC, the state was not run by the proletariat. The proletariat didn't control the surplus, and this is key in Marx's understanding and definition of communism. So calling it communism, Richard Wolff and other economists have argued, was just a way to demonize it. Richard Wolff wrote an article detailing the change in the Soviet Union from feudalism to state capitalism, not communism, and in China from feudalism to state feudalism and then to state capitalism. Again, never anywhere communism. State capitalism is when the state controls the surplus. Communism is when the workers control the surplus. So Wolf states, quote, none of the 20th century's state interventions achieved a change in the class, i.e. surplus organization of production to communism. No society has yet reorganized most or even many of its enterprises such that the productive laborers within them are also the collective appropriators and distributors of the surplus they produce. The events of 1917 and after in the USSR challenged and frightened many within societies where private capitalist class structures still prevailed. They reacted by criticizing the USSR as the actualization of, quote, communism, that evil, evil other of capitalism that they had long demonized as godless, dictatorial, and unworkable dystopia. Wolf asks, why did they accept working within a capitalist class structure? The answer is found in volume one of Capital. Workers will produce a surplus for state capitalists if and when political, cultural, and economic processes pressure and persuade them to do so. Those processes included the passage of specific Soviet laws, their execution by the government, and their adjudication by Soviet courts, the planning of the economy by an economic bureaucracy, the design and implementation of school curricula, and so on. In a further irony, because Soviet leaders from Stalin forward had declared this system to be socialism en route to communism, the crisis and collapse of their economy was conceived not as a crisis of a state form of capitalism, but instead as a failure of socialism. 
So the PRC was more like state feudalism. Here um, was the CPC, the Communist Party of China, developed rules which did not allow for class mobility. So this is certainly not Marxist. Rural workers were still bound to the state lands. And when they produced, what they produced was sold to the state at discount prices. They produced for the good of industry and sacrificed their own interests to do so. So this is more like feudalism. Why did the people in China accept this state feudalism? Again, Wolf states, images of the state as benevolent, the social organizer, a provider, and hence proven vehicle for meeting the needs of the Chinese people work to preclude any consciousness of the state's class position as receiver of what the workers' surpluses were. Indeed, scholars generally agree that the CPC policy of providing basic sustenance and social services raised the level of rural and urban living standards and life expectancy. So there was a mixture of state control over people's lives and some benevolence. Then there was a tra transition to state capitalism in China post-Mao. The increasing power of bureaucracy, Wolf describes, is also what concerned Weber, which is where we will go next after we finish capital and transcending capitalism through cooperative practices. Now, when you read this book by Catherine Mulder, in her intro, she talks briefly about some of the problems with how economics is usually taught and how Marx has been misunderstood. Each chapter from there is going to focus on a different worker cooperative. So the London Symphony Orchestra is one. Lusty Ladies is another. Green Bay Packers. New Era Windows. And there's a chapter called Worker Self-Directed Enterprises in State Capitalist Cuba. Mulder's critique of Marxist scholarship and economics in general is that there's a narrow focus on ownership in Marxist analysis that does not allow us to accurately analyze worker exploitation or what truly counts as a worker self-directed enterprise or WSDE. Also, Marxist economics is not taught in this way with all of its complexities. Richard Wolff talks about being the poster child of what achievement looks like. He's Ivy League educated in economics, but when it comes to Marxist thought, he had to teach himself. So this is not even something that is widely discussed and debated in, in mainstream economics education. There is no serious discussion on Marxist economics. Just like in sociology, we've talked about how there was for a very long time no serious integration of Du Bois into mainstream sociology, right? African-American scholar Du Bois or Anna Julia Cooper, often known as the female Du Bois. We're not required to read these things. And so it's similar in economics, not being required to read this Marxist economics. So Marx is often misinterpreted by people who don't take the time to read him. Economics is taught in a way that's too abstract and rarely engages in empirical research. Wolf points this out in the lecture that I shared earlier. What, what is new Marxian class analysis? I summarize this in my review of Dr. Mulder's book on page 845. And so I state, NMCA gets to the root of worker exploitation by focusing centrally on the surplus, who produces it, how it is distributed, and who controls its distribution. NMCA, or New Marxian Class Analysis, offers a corrective to standard Marxist analysis that focuses only on ownership and profit. So Dr. Mulder is critical not only of conservative mainstream economics, but also traditional Marxist and liberal scholarship. A narrow focus on ownership does not accurately explain exploitation. Her ethnography of the Cuban farm illustrates the purest form of a WSDE. However, under the standard Marxist analysis, the workers would be viewed as exploited because they don't own the land. With NMCA, the workers are not viewed as exploited because they do have complete control over the surplus they produced and they have complete control over their working conditions. Conversely, the Green Bay Packers have shareholders that are owners, but they do not directly exploit the workers, the players and the coaches. As shareholders, the only thing they get is voting power. They are owners, but they have no class position. They make no profit and they make no decisions concerning the players. They are also not true WSDEs. 
So Mulder states of the Green Bay Packers, the shareholders in their positions as owners hold no class positions within the NMCA methodology. They have no direct relationship with the players in their capacity as surplus value producing workers. That is, they cannot hire or fire players, nor can they find them or give them instructions about how to do their jobs more, efficient, more efficiently. Thus, they do not occupy a fundamental class position as appropriator. In her other chapter on sex, sex workers in the case study of lusty ladies, they were done in by the union's narrow vision of management. The union wouldn't represent them because the workers became management as part of their WSDE, or worker-centered democracy. Yet the workers had control over their working conditions. So this is a critique also of labor unions and how they view working conditions and ownership, etc. She's also talked about in my classes why she chose not to use the word communism in her book. She explained what we've already addressed in this class, issues in how the word communism has been used to describe fascism. She distinguishes between communism with a capital C and with a lowercase c. So in a footnote, she states, whenever the word communism is capitalized, I'm referring to the socioeconomic political process that is, was the focus of centrally planned economies, much like the former USSR. However, when communism is not capitalized, I'm referring to a particular class process where a group of workers collectively appropriate and subsequently distribute the surplus they produce. And she has a story about how some of her mentor, mentors were telling her not to use the word communism, even though theoretically that is what she is finding. There's too much baggage with the word and people aren't properly educated on what it really is. So it shuts down any conversation because people become very reactionary to the word. It's kind of like, I'm not a feminist, but it's like, I'm not a communist, but now there's a debate over whether or not we should use the word communism or socialism. Do we continue to use the words and trust people to become re-educated in what it actually means because the terminology is important? Or are people so miseducated and so reactionary that they're not going to be open-minded enough to understand this process and just should we scrap the word altogether? And you can think about that yourselves as you're reading Catherine Mulder's book. So also take a look at, I've provided here some clips from you, a trailer from Weekonomics. Um, I think you can get that at CUNY's library. This documentary goes over the WSDEs in Emilia Romagna in Italy, and that's where Dr. Mulder most recently finished an ethnography. And then there's also a clip of Tom Hartman's interview with Richard Wolf on Mondragon, probably one of the most well-known WSDEs.